The following is a production of New Mexico State University. I will use the podium since I have a few notes. That's the only way I can get through everything that I want to cover in this short period of time. Well, congratulations to all of you that have joined New Mexico State University. You joined a uh, great university, a unique university in many respects because we are a land-grant college. And a land-grant college is, is different than an ordinary university. And we'll talk a little bit about that both as it impacts locally on this particular university and from a national viewpoint. Uh, but first, uh, since you are new, I'll tell you the story of what I call the now famous tissue issue. And you can't uh, be here very long without knowing about this particular issue. It's not necessarily a land-grant uh, mission, but it is important. Uh, some time ago, uh, we had an editor of the Roundup by the name of uh, Jess Williams. He called himself Cowchip Williams, and he wrote under that byline, Cowchip Williams. He wrote an article in the Roundup, and he said he did not understand why a prestigious university like New Mexico State University could not afford the roll-type tissues in the bathrooms on campus. He said those little squares, and this is a dispenser. He said those little squares, <coughs> they just do not do the job. And he wrote two big long columns about the problems with these little squares. Well, I uh, read that with interest. You know, you have to read the Roundup to find out what's going on in the student side of the university. And I sympathized with Calchip. Uh, when I moved into the president's office, the uh, bathroom next to the president's office was equipped with these little squares. <laughs> it took me six years to convince the physical plant department to provide roll-type tissues for the commode next to the president's office. And that was the only one on campus. But since I sympathized with cow chips so much, I, I wrote uh, a memo to Doug Black, who was director of the physical plant department, and I said, Doug, you know, I think cow chip has a point. Uh, would you look into this? Well, he wrote me a two-page memo. I mean, it was the saddest memo I have ever seen. <laughs> He told me how many commodes we had on campus, and I was surprised we had that many, <laughs> what it would cost to convert to the roll-type tissue, and the boys would take these rolls and they'd decorate the girls' cars and the girls' dormitories, and the, the waste that would be involved, he gave me an estimate of a cost of conversion. Well, by this time, uh, we had named uh, Dr. Halligan as the incoming president. So I bundled up Cow Chip's article, Doug Black's sad memo from the physical plant department. I sent it to President Halligan, and I said, Dr. Halligan, here's one issue, the tissue issue, that I'm transferring to the next administration. <laughs> if you need a consultant on this job, I'll be glad to serve in that capacity but you'll have to provide a bathroom for me next to my office equipped with the roll-type tissue. <laughs> well, Dr. Halligan moved to New Mexico State University. They transferred me, uh, they gave me an office over in International Programs in Garcia Annex. Well, I checked out Garcia Annex. Here were these little squares. But Calchip Williams and the students had made so much fuss about the uh, tissue that Corbett Center, student union, had been converted to their old type tissue. So I, every day I'd walk from Garcia Annex 
over to Corbett Center so that I could at least have the luxury of the roll type tissue. Well, I went on and on and on and on. Finally, uh, John Owens, the Dean of Agriculture, called me over and uh, they presented this mounted tissue issue plaque and he and Doug Black informed me that all of the commodes on campus had been converted to the roll type tissue. It took 14 years under my administration, <laughs> eight years under Dr. Halligan before we got the job done. So you see, there are some problems with the bureaucracy and the decision-making process. Anyway, that story got all over the state and we had some really interesting uh, comments about it. But back to the land-grant mission. Uh, this university opened its doors uh, as Las Cruces College in 1888. The college was started by Hiram Hadley. There is a building named after him, the administration building, and a few local citizens. Uh, when Hadley, our first president, died in 1922, Dr. Harry Kent, the then president of the university, summarized Hadley's vision of the university in these terms. He built for both men and women because he had a vision of the duty and usefulness of each. He built a college which could conduct research because he loved truth. He planned for the application of science benefiting humanity because he believed that all should have plenty and be happy. He knew that knowledge meant power. He realized that joy comes with culture and refinement. He worked and prayed that the school should stand for the highest morality, the strongest faith, and the greatest tolerance. That was the vision that Hiram Hadley had. It wasn't too long after Las Cruces College was started that they learned about the Morrill Act, the Land Grants College Act, and the possibility that this college might be designated as the Land Grant College for the territory of New Mexico. The first step was to uh, get legislation from the territory of, uh, of New Mexico. And the result was uh, what they called the Rody Act, which created a university in Albuquerque and in St. Asylum in Las Vegas, a school of mines at Socorro, and an agricultural college at Las Cruces. This act, the Territorial Rody Act, opened the way toward the land grant status under the Morrill Act of 1862. Now the Morrill Act of 1862 uh, is undoubtedly the most significant national legislation enacted in the United States relating to higher education. The act directed that 30,000 acres of land for each senator be set aside with the income from this land designated to help finance a college in each state and territory. The mandate for education contained in the Morrill Act was clearly a break from the highly exclusive European academic tradition. And I quote, the leading object shall be, and of course you see that on all the doors, the leading object shall be, without excluding other scientific and classical studies, and including military tactics, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and mechanic arts in such manner as the legislatures of the states may respectively prescribe in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrious classes in the several pursuits and professions of life. Now, the intent of uh, Congress in passing the Morrill Act was to provide educational opportunities to the children of the, quote, clerks, artisans, storekeepers, farmers, miners, mechanics, teachers, and laborers, as well as the children of clergymen, lawyers, physicians, and wealthy merchants. Now, this requirement for 
open admission for and to extend out to everyone, the charge is clear. The land-grant college is to make education available to the masses and to encourage all those who desire an education and have the motivation to pursue an education to gain access. This does not and should not mean sacrificing standards in academic programs. A couple of more comments about the, uh, the teach, teaching mission which uh, was certainly unique in those days. Uh, the Morrill Act obviously laid the groundwork for diversity in the student body and in the faculty and staff as well. Our first graduating class in 1894 consisted of five students. One was a girl, Agnes Williams, and one was Hispanic, Fabian Garcia. Now, Garcia was a native of Chihuahua, Mexico. He started uh, the first research in Chile and eventually became director of the Agricultural Experiment Station. He was recognized uh, nationally and internationally as a leader. Uh, now, I said that was the first graduating class. Actually, the, the first uh, arrangements were made for a first uh, loan senior who was scheduled to graduate to Samuel Steele when he was shot by a drunken cowboy in downtown Las Cruces. So all plans for the commencement uh, at that time had to be canceled and you all know uh, the tradition now that we have about uh, Samuel Steele and recognizing him as the first potential graduate of New Mexico State University. And so you see uh, our charge for diversity in the student body, but there's also a charge with that for diversity in the faculty and staff. And uh, we went through a great deal of uh, struggle uh, to try to uh, eliminate a lot of the deficiencies in our staff, to try to uh, bring uh, female salaries up equal with male salaries. There were lots and lots of areas where there was uh, discrimination and, and lack of true uh, diversity. And uh, we had to satisfy the Dallas EEO office, Equal Employment Office. Uh, uh, in, uh, we worked with that particular office in Dallas. Uh, they blocked uh, our contracts grants and contracts a number of times because uh, we couldn't supply enough information uh, to satisfy them that uh, we were not discriminating against our own uh, employees. Uh, one of the interesting uh, inquiries that came out of that from the Dallas office was uh, an inquiry he wrote to the personnel office and he said, uh, how many employees do you have uh, broken down by sex? He said, alcohol is much more of a problem with us. <laughs> so that's the end of that EEO story. Anyway, we're, uh, we're proud of our diversity, and uh, we'll build on that base. Uh, now looking more specifically uh, to the research responsibility. The second significant piece of legislation and building on the Morrill Act, of course, was the passage of the Hatch Act in 1887, establishing the agricultural experiment stations and clearly defining the role of research for the land-grant universities in cooperation with state and uh, national governments. Uh, this, too, was a new approach to uh, higher education, as research had been carried out primarily along the European traditions, that is with separate institutes, uh, not tied to the teaching mission. Uh, the association of research with teaching has been an important element in building the economic base we have in the country today, and has been essential to quality graduate programs as well. It is clear that the responsibility for research unique to the land-grant college was clearly identified in federal and state legislation. And that pattern now has been adopted by nearly all of the universities. But none of the other universities uh, have the legislation to back it up 
and none of them do as effective a job of uh, outreach, tying research to teaching as the land-grant college. So it's certainly a tradition worth maintaining. However, sometimes uh, uh, research uh, may lead to trouble, and I'll give you an example here. Uh, one year we had cleared uh, our budget uh, through the Board of Regents, uh, through the all administrative channels, Board of Regents, uh, taken uh, to the, uh, the Board of Educational Finance, which is now the Commission on Higher Education, uh, cleared that channel and took it uh, to the, through the legislature and to the governor for final signature. Uh, the governor has a, uh, a board, he calls it the Board of Finance, and at that time, uh, Governor King was governor, and on that board was a former governor uh, from Portales, New Mexico, Governor Burroughs. And Governor Burroughs said to Governor King, I wasn't present uh, when this uh, root, should have been routine approval of the budget. Governor Burroughs said, I'm not going to approve New Mexico State University's budget, and I want President Thomas to come up here and talk to me. So I went to Santa Fe in a hurry, and Governor Burroughs pointed his finger at my chest. He said, your people, he said, your people have developed a peanut at the Clovis Experiment Station that cannot be processed by my equipment, and I'm the biggest peanut processor in the state of New Mexico. You should not have released that peanut. <laughs> well, uh, I call this peanuts in politics, you know. Anyway, I, I came back to the campus and I got uh, Phil Landeck was then the dean and Marvin Wilson was the director of the experiment station. I said, what in the world are we going to do? Here our budget is held up for peanuts. And uh, Marvin and Phil, they talked around and around and then on finally Marvin Wilson said, well, he said that we've been working on that peanut. You see, New Mexico produces at that time over 90% of the Valencia peanuts in the United States. And we had developed and released Valencia A, which was a great peanut. Now this was to be Valencia B. And Dr. Shea, who had been doing the research on this, said this new peanut uh, is, a, is a good producer. It has some disease resistance, which we didn't have in the other peanuts. He said it's ready for, to release. So he talked Dr. W or Wilson into releasing the peanut. So we went through the regular channels for releasing a new variety. And, and here this was to be Valencia B. Well, but I said, what are we going to do about this because it's been blocked, or but it's been blocked. And Marvin Wilson said, well, he said, you know, that peanut did have a little odd shape. It was a good producer, had a lot of disease resistance, but it had an odd shape. He said, why don't we just pull that peanut out of the release list? So I called Governor Burroughs and I said, we've pulled that peanut. Don't worry, it's no longer being released. So we got our budget released. Well, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is that we had to transfer Dr. Sheaf from uh, Clovis to Las Lunas. We had all kinds of discussions in the Board of Regents and all over the state about this peanut. We never did release Valencia B, but we, did, we released Valencia C sometime. But it was a great peanut, and we still uh, produce peanuts. It is, it's unlikely that either peanuts or politics will disappear from the state of New Mexico in the near future. So that's a little story about research. Now we go to extension, and most of you are in uh, extension or related to extension. Uh, this uh, third mission, again implemented by land-grant colleges, came with the passage of the Smith-Lever Act in 1914. And the papers in Las Cruces at that time said, this is a great day in New Mexico because we now have another charge to the university and a way to implement it. The act established the Cooperative Extension Service providing a mandate for extension and continuing education for the land-grant colleges. Now this mandate forged a special relationship between land-grant colleges and the people and the industries and the governments of their regions. It established an organized approach to the task of technology transfer, moving research information more rapidly and more directly 
into application by business, industry, and agriculture. The commitment to public service, first mandated in agriculture and home economics, is now an accepted responsibility for all departments in the university. And even some non-land grant universities make attempts at this, but they still do, do not do the job as well as the land grant universities. <clears throat> now I should add that uh, there were some attempts, or quite a few attempts, to uh, toward extension, the philosophy of extension and technology transfer uh, before the uh, Smith-Lever Act of 1914. Uh, Seema Knapp, uh, who worked at Iowa Ag College, is really uh, defined as the founder of, of agricultural extension because he tried a lot of different approaches to uh, take uh, research information uh, to the farmer sector of our economy. And therefore, he's, he's recognized as the father of extension. The uh, National Association of State Universities and Land Grant Colleges now has a Seaman A. Knapp lecture in honor of his efforts in, uh, as the father of extension. And I had the privilege of presenting that lecture uh, to the Land Grant College Association in 1991. I should tell you one story here about uh, extension and communications. You've got, we've got all kinds of communications specialists here. Uh, right after World War II, you know, we had the Marshall Plan. We had all kinds of uh, techniques in place to try to help rebuild uh, both enemies and uh, friends and allies alike. And I was on a uh, PL-480 project uh, working with the uh, American University at Thessalonica, Greece. Uh, it was the first foreign assignment that I had <clears throat> after World War II. I was, uh, I, I don't understand Greek. And I don't understand some of the Greek organizations on campus even. <laughs> uh, and I don't speak Greek. So, uh, I was working through an interpreter, and I was speaking to this group of agricultural agents, uh, or equivalent of, of county agricultural agents in, in Greece. They were, they were all, a lot of the other countries were trying to model after the, after the American system, the land grant college system. And I, I started out the lecture, like I usually do, with a, with a joke. And I selected the wrong joke. I selected one that took quite a long time uh, to hit the punchline, and instead of having sentence by sentence translation, why I went through the whole thing, you know, and I hit the punchline, and there wasn't anybody uh, responded at all. <laughs> and I turned to uh, uh, my interpreter; he said just a few words, and everybody laughed. And so after the lecture was over, I cornered him, and they said, "Oh, you know, we've been traveling in the country here in Greece for a long time." visiting these farmers, and, and sometimes I'd talk a long time and you'd say just a few words, and sometimes I'd say a few words and you'd talk a long time. I said, I don't care what language you think in or speak in, you can't tell that joke in that few words. Well, he said, Doc, he said, uh, we, we don't understand your sense of humor too well here in Greece. He said, I just told him the professor told the joke, now everybody laughed. Uh, you know, sometimes our attempts at communication uh, fall flat. Now I should uh, mention another significant piece of uh, legislation that was passed in 1917, the Smith-Hughes Act, uh, which creates uh, vocational agriculture programs in the United States. Again, the land-grant college, uh, although not not specifically restricted to the land grant college, but the, the bulk of that program fell uh, under the responsibility of the land grant college. And that, with the FFA programs, and like the 4-H programs in extension, has been a very effective program and, and one in which uh, we have and continue to accept a large responsibility uh, for implementation. Uh, since you're uh, in the College of Ag and Home Economics, I should mention a little bit about the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. 
In the beginning of the uh, land-grant colleges, the responsibilities for regulatory activities, a lot of market development, other kinds of things, uh, were in the College of Agriculture and Home Economics. Uh, most states, well, all states except two, have moved uh, regulatory activities and a lot of other activities uh, to the, uh, the governor's office. Uh, we remain uh, uh, one of the states where the Department of Agriculture is under the Board of Regents. And you've probably already met, read some about the controversy that may be generated as a result of the new governor's uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, replacing people in, uh, uh, on certain boards and commissions and in certain capacities. Uh, the, the Department of Agriculture, under the Board of Regents, has been very effective, much more professional than where the departments are in central government. Uh, some, in some states, they elect the Secretary of Agriculture. Some states, the governor appoints the Secretary of Agriculture. In our case, it's under the Board of Regents. There's a lot of interaction between the Experiment Station Extension people and the State Department of Agriculture. And we're a much more professional organization, and I would hate to see that lost. Uh, every uh, governor, uh, while I was in the presidency, has tried to move the Department of Agriculture to, the, to Santa Fe. They've been un unsuccessful because of the support of the Farm and Livestock Bureau, the uh, cattlemen and all the agricultural organizations. And even though there, there are sometimes uh, some uh, questions about what, uh, what responsibility rests with Experiment Station or Extension Service in the Department of Agriculture, we've had an excellent relationship. It's been very effective. And Frank Dubois, as many of you know, is uh, going to retire this summer. So that will be, uh, will be quite a political uh, battle uh, when that comes up. Now, uh, I'm going to wind this down by uh, making a few comments about the, about the book and uh, make a presentation to Susan. She mentioned this book. Uh, uh, my, uh, my son said, you know, that'll never sell calling it the academic ecosystem. And it hasn't. <laughs> uh, this is a century-long history of New Mexico State University, and if I had just put a century-long history of New Mexico State University, people might have looked at it the second time. But you see, my background's ecology, range ecology. And the reason that I call it an academic ecosystem is that it is an ecosystem. There's interaction between the physical components, that's the land and the buildings and the laboratories and all of the physical components, the biological components, which are the students and the faculty and the Board of Regents and the governor and the people and the alumni and all of the other different groups, uh, physical, biological, and uh, nutrients in the system, and that's the monetary side, the financial side. These three interact to create a, an academic climate. And out of that climate should emerge the major goals of the institution. That's the expansion and transfer of knowledge and preservation of knowledge. But there's pollution in the system, just like all other ecosystems. There's contamination. There are even a few endangered species. Twelve of the 20 presidents have been fired by the Board of Regents, for example. But there are other endangered species in it. So it is an ecosystem. Uh, but uh, maybe that wasn't the right way to tell the history of New Mexico State University. See, I started, uh, I started to, uh, at the request of the deans, uh, to write about my experience. This was just before I retired. Uh, so for posterity. So I prepared this book, Everything I Know About University Administration. It has 13 chapters in it, and I've got chapters on the students, the product, and the problem, 
the role of the regents, research, extension, academic freedom, tenure, controversy in the role of press, affirmative action, equal employment opportunity, private giving, alumni relations, everything in here, 13 chapters. It was put out on, uh, by the Aggie Press on Friday the 13th, in 1983. And as you know, all, all the pages are blank. I've, I've, uh, I've autographed this to Susan. To see page 27. Now, uh, the, the problem here is that this was put out in 1983. There have been a lot of changes since 1983. That's a long time ago. So I got me a stamp, and I, it, it's a revised edition stamp, and I have stamped this with a revised edition. That brings it up to date, Susan, so it's all in there in case you have aspirations. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks, thanks a lot. That's, that winds it up. The preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.